They look quite cool. They do. <laughs> you know what I always call my Frankie Knuckles glasses. I was going to say you're uh, it's uh, you're ever the DJ, aren't you? That's what it is. It's yeah. all those all yes. those uh, nights stood at the turntables there, giving it some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fifty years of it. Fifty, 50 years. Fifty-three years. Nineteen seventy-one was my first DJ. Is that where this bloke came in? That's me. That's in nineteen seventy-eight. That's at the Ritz. <laughs> See, I didn't give a shit back then. Never, <laughs> Ian Levine has never suffered fools like William Hartnell. I'll take that from no. William Hartnell. I really, when people talk shit, when they talk rubbish, I've got no patience for them whatsoever. I was talking to Anthony Wayne the other day, and I said, you know, one of the best moments of my life, certainly in recent years since, since the birth of my children, was the first time that I got a bollocking from Ian Levine. It was extraordinary. I <laughs> It made, me the, it made a lot of enemies. <laughs> made a, lot of a hell of a lot of friends as well, my yeah, friend. So and we're yeah, going to touch yeah, on some of them. Thankfully, the, thankfully, the supporters outweigh the trolls. But I have made yeah. a lot of enemies, a lot of very vicious people. I look, I look myself up online. And I read things, and I think, how could I put up with this? I don't have. To when you it. when you read it, do you think who's that bloke they're talking about? And I read something the other day. The guy says, first of all, he said. Ian Levine claimed to be a continuity advisor during the 80s, but it's a lie. You know, I mean, how the hell do you think I got to auction all the stuff at Longley? How do you think I got every script? How do you think J&T was at my house every day? It's not a lie. And then he says, Ian Levine claims to save the Daleks, but it's a lie. You know, I've got witnesses. I've got three witnesses that were there when I pulled the tape off and put the cans back on the shelf and, so not, and rushed around with John Bridger to Sue, Sue Molden has been on stage with me and corroborated it. How can they say I'm lying, though, when I say I saved the Daleks? It's just sickening that people would attribute it. It's a malicious defamation. There are characters out there who, and, and particularly some of the younger ones who are kind of, they're parroting what, other, what they've heard other people say. Who, no, if, you, if, you say, if you said that black is black and white is white, they'd argue that, no, actually, black is white and white is black, simply because you've said it. The Benjamin Cooks of this world, I know, but no, no time for them. No time for them. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I hope, yeah, I'd like uh, get in touch, Ben, and <laughs> at some point, I don't want to be remembered for the negative things. I want to remember to the positive things, and the positivity is bringing all of my missing Doctor Who's back. The BBC want to do them one way; they want to reinvent them in garish colour and upside down gravity and all sorts of stuff like the celestial tour maker and i looked at it and yeah. i can't bear it i don't want to see that i don't want that to be my collection i want to be able to start an earthly child and go right through up to empire of death and watch every single episode in order with nothing missing nothing as a cartoon and nothing that didn't look like it did when it was transmitted like stupid fuels in the deep or abominable snowman were pathetic so i decided to do it myself so then we've got better and better and better now even the People like Jeremy Bentham, who was, of course, the editor of Doctor Who magazine and wrote many books. At first, he was not convinced. He said, I don't think this is ever going to be a kind of replacement for the missing episodes. But now he's changed his tune because when he watches them, he realizes they almost are the missing episodes. He came up to the BFI last time. He said, Ian, those Simon in the 10th planet look better than the ones in parts one, two, and three. They are proper chilling. And, you know, and, and the Web of Fear 3 that fits in with episodes one, two, four, five, and six. I mean, now I can watch them at night in my bedroom and enjoy them in order. And I'm actually bringing the Doctor Who's back. And they're never going to turn up. All this film is fabulous crap. It's never going to bring anything back. Let's start with, with Jeremy, because he sent you this message which you were good enough to share with everybody. Jeremy Bentham is, again, just like yourself, long-term from day one Doctor Who fan, isn't he? Yeah, well, Noted when I first... historian. On 1976, when I bought my first video recorder, I phoned Doctor Who office, the production office, where Philip Hinchliffe was the producer. And I spoke to his secretary. We had a lovely chat. I explained I'd been into it all my life. How in the 60s, I used to write the episodes up and tech record them, and how I kept the memory of them alive by writing them down, and how now I wanted to be able to see them again, which has always been my longest wish since I was a kid, to see them again with the video recorder. Now, 
This is just before Mask of Mandraga aired. I bought the machine on my birthday. It was in the summer break between, you know, the season four, start of season 14. Which, it's nearly 50 years ago. We're talking about 48 years ago. So I said to her, you know, maybe there are other Doctor Who fans that have been taping. She said, I don't, not that I know. She said, but I'm going to put you in touch with the newly formed Doctor Appreciation Society. This is the phone number. It's historian, Jeremy Bentham. She gave me his number in Hendon. So I phoned him up and explained, you know, we, we got on like a house on fire. And I went around. In those days, I went to London from Blackpool. I was living in Blackpool. I'd drive down on a Monday and stay in London till Friday, then drive back to Blackpool to DJ at the weekends. So I was in London every week. I was also very friendly with the... Uh, woman that ran target i got myself endeared into the books so she let me come around and get the books before anyone else so when i went to see jeremy i brought him a copy of i think planet of the daleks i think off the space wall one or the other and uh he was very excited that he had an advanced copy of one of the books you know we yeah. shared a very we're the same age we grew up with the early child we both watched the first episode onwards and he was fascinated by our transcripts ended up bringing some down for him to look at and he, the Dwas was brand new. And Jan Vincent Ruskin, Stephen Payne, ran the Dwas. So he got me to come to that one of their first ever Dwas meetings. It was in the college where Jan and Steve were studying in uh, Wimbledon or somewhere near. Like Jan, I think it was near. I think it was probably Wimbledon. Is this the one that Keith Barnfather's told me about? Yeah, Keith was there. The, this is the first Dwas meeting I went to in 1976. It was uh, Jan Vincent Roach and Stephen Payne, Keith Barnfather and Gordon Blows, Richard Landon, um, uh, Mark Sinclair. Um, I can't remember who else was there. There weren't many more. It was about 10 of us. And everyone was fascinated. I got the video machine. Now, Richard Landon, I got very friendly with. Had again watched every Doctor Who from the first episode. And Richard, when. When I, you know, we got, became such friends, he took me round to his friend James Russell, who was a teenage son of Ken Russell, the film director. He lived in Labrook Square in London, a very, very posh house, like about a six-story house overlooking the park in Holland, Holland Park area, not, not quite Notting Hill, still Holland Park. Very, very, you know, well, you got to remember Ken Russell was a millionaire film director. Yeah. And his wife, Shirley, was a massively Shirley Russell. She was the film designer for more films than you could get, a costume designer for more films than you could count. So both his parents were in the movie business. So anyway, because he was in an affluent uh, family, he was able to buy, or they were bought for him, a early Phillips, same as mine, the 1501, the black one. The big machines, weren't they, those? took cartridge type tapes sort of squarish cartridge one reel was on top of another reel and when you played them it went diagonally downwards across the heads the heads were diagonally in oh. the machine it was it was very crude but it was much better quality than vhs which was the yet to come hadn't been invented yet much sharper much clearer picture except the more you watch the same tape the more the top of the pitch used to bend and buckle, and you got blue little streaks at the top. It couldn't yeah. handle the the edge damage, we called it. And, and you you do see that, don't you, on on a video that survives from that period yeah. that was that only exists from domestic recordings. I'd wondered where that distortion, that particularly well, there, there distinctive mostly, distortion, there came were mostly of mine that uh, I gave to the the uh, restoration team to use for the Blu-rays. You know, I'd take the. It's a taped off air, Elizabeth Slater's last, last interview before she left in the hand of fear. And I took the very first ever swap shop, which had uh, Tom Baker on it. And these we were, were talking about that the other week. Team. So, as you were recording those things, Ian, and obviously this is technology that wasn't in, that was only in select homes in, in Britain, certainly in Britain. Of course, was I'd always wanted a video recorder, but never found one. The first time they were domestically available was 1976. In fact, had I looked earlier, had I really tried, Back in 73 or 74, I might have been able to have bought one and taped Invasion of the Dinosaurs and that kind of stuff. But they were never really available to the public till 70, 75, 76. So in, 70, in January 76, I compiled, you no, know, I've been to America and there's a guy called Dave McAleer. I compiled my first album from 1974. He wrote, 
he ran the soul division of Pi Records. And then he left for yeah. 20th Century Records. And uh, I, I made my first record, The Exciters, which he put out. So in January of 76, I stayed at his house in London. It's uh, up at Norwood, I think, South London. I stayed there, put me up. Mm. And he had a video, the first video recorder. Man was a 1501, but this is before man. This is a 1500, which was silver and wood, as opposed to the 1501 that was black. Anyway, he had this silver and wood Phillips recorder, and he just taped that. It was a Monday, I think. I'd come down on a Monday, and he taped on the Saturday, Brain and Mobius Part 1. Yeah. Now, I had never, ever in my life ever seen a Doctor Who other than Transmission, remember? The only time we ever saw anything at that point, we, I mean, in the 60s, the only Doctor Who ever repeated was Episode 1, and then even the Daleks was repeated off the end of Wheel in Space. And then throughout yeah. the 70s, they ought to repeat like the demons, the sea devils and stuff. In um, omnibus form, more often than not, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Planet of Evil, just before I bought my video recorder, which would have broken my heart, except James Russell had taped it, so I just copied his tape. We brought my, sh my machine to London, plugged them together, and I just taped his copy of uh, of uh, Planet of Evil, which was what in the Suntaran experiment, which was wonderful. Anyway, you got to remember that back, going back to January 76, at that point, I hadn't met the Dwas. I had never seen a Doctor Who other than on transmission. And here he had with this machine where he taped Brandon Morby's part one. So I watched it and I went, stopped it, rewound it, and watched it again. I watched it three times. I was <laughs> so hooked. Three times. Stupid, stupid, stupid me. Didn't think to say to him, Dave, can you keep this tape? Because what he did is he wiped off what he He took them to watch when he wasn't in. So he wiped it off and then would take the next episode. So I could have kept Brady yeah. Morris Part 1 because we went to such trouble for the next couple of years to get anything we could. Me and James Russell drove all the way over to Leeds just to get a single episode of Revenge of the Cybermen off a guy called Angus Tauber who had taped it on a machine that Jan, I think, had found out about. You understand this was pioneering days. Nobody had these episodes. This is what I'm this is what I'm curious about because you know I was quite an early adapter. Or should I say my family was in our home? We were quite uh, quite early adapters of this sort of technology as well. So with recorders that you could rent out of outlets that were in a lot of high streets in Great Britain. When but when you talk about this kind of technology and this sort yeah, of experience what you're, showing, what you're showing on the screen here is way before way later than what we had. Yeah, exactly. So for me, this seems like pretty primitive. So the kind of stuff that you're talking about it had a much higher uh line it could I think because British TV was six two five lines, the uh Phillips machine could inco or or reproduce up to 260 of those lines, whereas the VHS was only about 205. The Phillips was a much superior system. And so course, when you were recording, all, the, when the you were recording part, things like that, when you were recording things like that domestically, Ian, what I was wondering was because it was new technology to you as well. Is where you did you used to sit there, sort of watching the machine to make sure it was still working? And yeah. did, did it require any maintenance, sort of on the spot oh, there and I then? Would. It's funny you said that because I would stand up in the middle of Mask of Mandraga Part One, look over the machine, make sure the wheels were turning. Yes, yeah, I was that paranoid. But I kept them. There were you could only buy one-hour tapes and two episodes per tape, so big and bulky. I kept, built built shelves specially for them, from Mask of Mandraga all the way up to um, well, the, the season seventeen, Destiny of the Daleks season. I yeah. definitely recorded on both. I bought a Umatic, but I recorded on both Umatic and Phillips. For you. Right through the JNT store, I carry on recording on two formats at once, both the Phillips okay. and the Umatic. Phillips, because just because I'd, I didn't, I'd, I'd done everything up to that point on the Phillips, I just being a completist and a bit of an obsessive collector, I wanted to keep them all beautiful and neat. The Mask yeah. of Dragon Parts 1 and 2, Mask of Dragon Parts 3 and 4, The Hand of Fear Parts 1 and 2, all on a shelf looking beautiful. And you anyway, had to build well, your own shelving just to, just to house them. I've still got the covers. I've still got them. Still got the tapes. That's the point. The tapes. Keep, um, Ed Stradling's borrowed them and tested them for the continuity. They still play. The Mask of Dragon tape still plays nearly 50 years later. 
See, and there, there I am boasting that my copy, my off-air copy of The Five Doctors still plays from 83, and here you are with things from nearly, from like six or seven, eight years earlier. Yeah, 76. Or, I, from The Mask of Mandraga, I never, ever missed a single episode. I had, I remember there being a problem with the Armageddon Factor when I was out of the country, part one. And I had to pay someone to actually come into my house. Although you could do them on a timer, I didn't want all yeah. that extra rubbish on my tapes. I had to pay someone to come into my yeah. house and press the two buttons, play and... <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what I would have done. Down ...together to make sure they were there in person because I wasn't in the country, so I didn't miss a single one. I lived in Blackpool on Squires Gate, which is the corner of Blackpool and St. Anne's. And it was the, the one road comes down and goes to the next one. The right angle, and right by me was Blackpool's little airport, a very tiny little airport with propeller planes. But their radar dish was literally a couple hundred yards away from my apartment, from my flat. Mm. I moved out of my parents and got a flat in Lindsay Court, which my ad adjacent to my parents' night club, the Lemon Tree. My parents had given me the flat there. So uh, when you, the ra what happens is that the radar dish turned around every time it turned a certain angle, you got blipped. Little white dashes across the screen, which were there on the Master Men Dragon and all the Hand of Fear and Deadly Assassin Part 1 and 2. And I was so sick of these little white dashes, I got a special expert in by the end of Deadly Assassin Part 2 to fix it with an attenuator to cut down the signal so it didn't get effective. The signal was too strong, so it took the radio. So I had to attenuate it down, and I managed to get rid of the blips. They're always almost there, but not the same. The big solid white dashes and things. An attenuator. Yeah. That does sound very, very kind of flux capacitor. Kind of. <laughs> it sounds very Hartnell. I've actually, I actually wonder this, Ian. I, I did mean to ask you this before. Why? What prompted you to move from Blackpool to London in the first place? Was it through the? Because you were doing so many things. That there was I the was DJ DJing work. At, there was yeah, DJ at Blackpool Mecca on a Saturday. And Angels in Berlin on a Sunday. Angels was the first British club to be like Studio Fifty Four, apart from the Embassy in London. It was super high tech, expensive equipment, lasers, and all the expensive lighting. And they needed a DJ to mix, blend the music together, American style. And I was the first English DJ to do it. The only other one was a DJ at the embassy called Greg James, who was imported from Philadelphia. And I learned from him. He was a bit of a mentor to me. He used to practice at the embassy early on. So I learned to mix records together. And so this place was so exclusive. Q, I did this every Sunday night there. There were queue around the block to see me. It was like trying to get into Studio 54. So it was, you know, I was there doing this. And... The Embassy Club, which I told you I used to go to in London, where Greg Jones was the DJ, the owner decided to open the biggest gay club in Europe. So he bought the building behind Charing Cross Station with all the train arches, which was called, originally called Global Village. It was a, a roller skating a disco thing. He bought it and turned it into a high-tech gay club that held 2,000 people. And because I was the only person able to mix the records, I was poached and headhunted to come down to London in the summer of seventy of ninety, so the, sorry, the summer of seventy nine. In nineteen seventy nine, my parents sold up their big mansion, and my sisters and them moved. Well, they moved to Miami basically, but I couldn't legally okay. move to Miami. So my parents actually moved to the Bahamas for five years and spent six months of the year in the Bahamas, six months of the year in Miami, so they could finally get American citizenship. That's how it happened. I refused to go. I said, no way. I didn't want to uproot my whole life. Everything, my northern soul, the disco stuff, everything was based in, around me. I, I didn't want to move. Because even though you do love American culture, the music and the comic books and a man, all manner of other things, you are very so proudly British, aren't you? Very, very. I don't want to live in America. Thank you. Could you imagine living in a country where Donald Trump could run for president? Could you imagine that? God forbid. Mm. Anyway. So I was headhunted to move down. Then what happened, of course, is the guy was running heaven, got fired by the owner, a very nasty row, got kicked out, and a new guy was brought in to run it who didn't know who I was. And suddenly, from being headhunted and given a guaranteed job, I was suddenly having to apply for the job all over again, which really pissed me off. But anyway, so I ended up moving. You know, I saw my flat in black. My father told me whatever I could get for the flat, we could put towards a house in London. He put the rest in towards the house in London. 
So we saw the it was a long time ago. The house prices were very different then. We sold my flat for fourteen and a half thousand pounds. We bought a house in London of my friend for twenty eight thousand pounds in Park Royal in North Acton, a place called Wesley Avenue, and I moved in. The house was far too small for me, with all my thousands of records and now my growing videotapes <laughs> and the twelve inch <laughs> singles and albums and literally, literally like forty thousand singles at that point. There was the whole house was I had to build a loft. You were a mobile sing. archive. I know, but it got very silly because when I started DJing at Heaven, I got paid two hundred pound a week for five nights a week, and the records to play at Heaven were costing me at least three hundred pound a week. So I had to sell off my all my valuable Northern Soul records just to survive. So you would buy the records that you would play at these clubs. That they wouldn't be things yeah. that the clubs would own, no. or that you would recommend they buy, and you would buy them in yourself to work the, the magic. I tried that at the beginning. That lasted five minutes. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't, you know, Why do we need that one? Why do we need that one? That kind of thing. Yeah, exactly that. So I had to buy them myself, which cost more money than they were paying me to DJ. Let alone cost of rate, you know, council tax rates. Then it just, I just, I was living from hand to mouth. What gave you the biggest thrill, Ian? Was it? Was it? Um the creative side to that kind of performance because DJing is performing, isn't it? Or was it, well, was it the effect it had? Few, I've done it for 53 years. So or was it the effect long. or was it the effect that it had on the people who were attending these venues uh, and experiencing hard, this? It's hard to explain because I was very different to most DJs. They did call me a legend. You know, I mean, I created a music form called high energy, which heaven was the home of. And which, first of all, we had a hit that sold 7 million records with a song called High Energy, and which yeah, had another 2 million selling called uh, Summer in So Little Time. My mu I took the music, blended it up and up, and took them up to a high, um, an enormous high where they're actually screaming their tits off. I'd, I'd by one in the morning, I've got them really high but, with the music. No, I can imagine. And, that, and, and to me, even though this is several decades on, and it's a different experience for you where you are. You're doing a lot of this from the privacy of your own home. It was the, all, effect it was that, the effect that you're having on your audience now for these AAI takes uh, on I new Doctor Who episodes, the reception they're getting uh, communally is pretty rapturous from what I'm yeah, seeing. Yeah, I know. But they're so, the two things are so different. Two, so different. My life but I've seen, but Ian, I've, I've life. seen... I've seen and I've heard the pleasure in your voice and seen you post about it on social media. When people say how much they're enjoying this stuff, y course, you love that, love that. I only love it because it's nice to have people that agree with what I feel. I, I can't, Doctor Who, the th the, I'm trying to explain the three most fact, important do motivating factors in my life, through backwards and forwards, have been Doctor Who, Northern Soul and Disco and all that goes with it, and genealogy, tracing my family. Those three things have dominated. I've done extraordinarily different things with them. I mean, people say that when I do things, no one else, I don't do things by halves. I do things in an outrageous way. I mean, in the same way as in 2000, which is 24 years ago, I organized a school reunion with all 30 members of our class, the original teachers, most of them are now dead, and we relived it. We even dressed up to play rugby and for the gym, it was like an outrageous. Yeah, you tell me that before. It's, it, but it's true. I mean, BBC Northwest filmed it. They put it on their six o'clock evening show kind of thing. It was in a, the fact that someone could go to recreate their their childhood as an experience like that. Do you no see what I, Do you see what I'm saying here, though, Ian? The, the, your experience, your experience there, yeah. your experience not, there with reuniting your classmates. Yeah, so you've got you, that. Cool. Yeah. Well, look, very important. Look, it's not, that's, not, that's not isolated. In 1989, I was so into no, Tamil Motown. None this of this is isolated. This is a pattern of behaviour uh, that I I'm noticing. All the original Motown artists, apart from Dana Ross, obviously, and Stevie Wonder. I got them all. But Mar I had Martha and Vandellas and everybody, the Marvelettes and uh, Jimmy Ruffin, everybody back at the Motown building, going in the studio, recording together and records together as as they were as a team with Motown, with the co-writing with the original Motown writers, Ivy Joe Hunter, who wrote Dancing in the Street, Sylvia Moore, who wrote My Sharia Moore, Johnny Bristol, who wrote Someday We'll Be Together. They all wrote the songs with me. I recreated the Motown sound 
with the original artist. These artists had been neglected when Barry Gordy moved Motown to Los Angeles. Detroit became a ghost town. The artists had had no hope. And I came to the, the city bringing them back. Front page of every Detroit newspaper, Detroit News, the Detroit Express, every newspaper, I was on the front page. I was on 11 different TV news programs in Detroit about Englishman comes to bring the Motown sound back. So I've done things like that. I did my school reunion. And the bringing back the missing Doctor Who's is yet another extension of how I like to never do things by halves. But you also attract very venomous people who get very jealous and bitter about what you do, want to put you down and mock it. The fact is, is that as Jerry Bentham said, when you watch 10 Planet 4, which has been lost forever, as you know. When you watch it with the Rick Simon looking so creepy, it really it is really creepy. Back. Richard Landon, but who was the, my close friend, as I mentioned earlier, and who was the editor of Doctor Who magazine, wrote me a letter, which I show people, saying that his wife had Geraldine died, so he was very miserable in his old age. He had nothing to look forward to. And now me making these episodes are giving him a whole new reason to live. And his Child, his parents had gone to America. He didn't want to go with them because he, he loved Doctor Who so much, so he refused to go. He stayed with his grandparents. And all those Saturday tea times with his grandparents watching Doctor Who, it all came back to him by seeing the missing episodes looking like they looked. My Doctor Who's look like the originals, no matter what certain naysayers say about See, them. So here, here I am getting to know you over the last however many months. Dan, can you imagine how pissed off the BBC are with me? That's their celestial trouble is what forced me into doing this because I could mm -hmm. not bear to see my holy relics, my youth, my beloved programmes just completely disrespected. See, see I, underst I understand a certain amount of where the BBC come from with this material in the way that they're trying to find new ways to ex to exploit it to know, enhance they, they, it and to and to bring it to more people so I, so I, I do understand it up to a point but here i see they don't want the older fans to get what they want uh paul henbury when he was talking about the underwater menace on stage he was the head of that department he's left now he specifically said we're not here to fill in the gaps for the fans we're here to reinvent these stories. Mark Ayres, when he stood on the stage, trying to defend his execrable Celestial Toy Maker that he'd put the sound for, trying to defend it, saying, I love it. It gives it a whole new dimension. It just made me want to hurl. See what I mean, though? It's but, it's fine. If if that's how Mark feels, then that's how Mark feels. It's fine. And if that's how Paul, if that was Paul, what was fair. Paul was tapping. Now I not, I agree. No, my so personal why? taste. I know, why? Ian. My my personal. I'm on your side. My personal taste line up completely with yours. But I do understand. For example, Paul, why he was saying the things that he was saying. If that's the job that they've been tasked, tasked with, that's their commission. I get that. But by the same measure, they've got to be. If I if they're going to be open about that, then it's up to us as the consumer to decide whether we're going to buy it or okay. not. If we're in full possession of the facts, then we can spend our money wisely. Why, Do you see what I'm saying? Why, there was some. Why are the fans like me, Jeremy Bentham, Richard Landon, Keith Barnfather, all those early fans who watched it from the beginning? Why are we so shitted upon, shat upon? Why? Why does nobody care that we want to see them as they were? So that when Russell T Davis decides to put the Daleks in color, he chops it down to seventy-five minutes from three hours. Well, and. Put, redoes the Dalek voices and gets Mark Harris to redo the music, part of which, when they get to the lift, sounds like techno, sounds like Kef McCulloch. Why desecrate the classics? It's I think there was a I think there was a belief that it would reach people that perhaps the actual archive material in that Look, elongated you, form wouldn't. And I, I'm, I'm unsha unsure as to the logic behind that, I'm, particularly because it's BBC no, 4. No, 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 no. This is something I feel very, very strongly about. I meet a lot of young new fans in the 20s, some in the late teens, who had grown to love Doctor Who for modern Who and therefore wanted to go back and investigate. And they actually love the black and white stuff. They don't hate it. This notion that the modern fans won't watch black and white is not true. They revere it. They, just, well, they like yeah, it they the do. way it was. They, do. they can't stand what was done with the toy maker and what was done every, with the Every toy person toy that sort of certainly comes to, comes to us at Type 40 feels exactly as you say. I mean, I can understand. I, maybe they've got a mind to a broad audience who might who might view out of curiosity, but I don't know whether that's in BBC4's. They are so stubborn. I, 
They are so stubborn. I thought Russell but Minton was a nice guy. Here's here's what I, I here's what I notice. He's got his head up his ass. One of my dear friends, who is very high up, went to him and he, she said to him, "You know, these Ian Levine things are quite good." And he screamed at him. He didn't want to know. He does not interested in looking at them. No, doesn't want to know. Some people are reaching bring the poison the head so much about me that they think it's automatically going to be shit. No, people don't realize. You know the funny thing? You know my biggest stalker of all from Phoenix, Arizona? I don't, I'm not naming I refuse to give him a name. But he makes videos weekly slagging me off. Slagging well, me that, off. that's one of the topics. That is one of the topics I did want this to get is, around this, to. This is funny. Listen, I have now found so many people watched him slagging me off and thought to themselves, these are quite good. These actually brought me new donators for the thing. <laughs> I slagging me off. This is where the joke's on him. I've actually had several people come to me, only discovering me by him slagging me off, who love what I'm doing so much. They've offered money to chip in to donate them. That's all thanks to him. So this idiot in Phoenix, Arizona, has actually had the reverse effect. He's actually brought people to me because he hates AI so much. He's obsessed with going on and on and on about it. And even, even the people that hate me agree that he's so obsessed. Yeah, thank you for helping. Him. So uh, seven months ago, historian and lifelong Doctor Who fan Ian Levine began an effort to reconstruct the fabled missing episodes of the series. So many people, including Ian himself, have spent decades hunting the globe for this material, and now he's using ever-evolving cutting-edge technology. Reactions may have been mixed on some levels from some quarters, but now all this time on, and with a growing army of supporters and contributors, the further development of this technology in just those few months has been extraordinary. So Ian and his associates have succeeded in producing to a finished standard almost half of those episodes officially missing from the BBC's uh, archives in this new form, all not, assisted. No, not almost half, over half. Over um, half. Oh, uh, I stand corrected. Over half now. 55 out of 97 <laughs> is not under almost half. 55. So it's all assisted and now regenerated through artificial intelligence. Ian, you, you recently said that you, you, want, you want to officially sort of name these, not just reconstructions now, but as regenerations. What was the thinking, what was the thinking behind that? What was the watershed moment with that? Recreations. It was suggested by one of my followers, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Henry Sassoon, who actually suggested they're not regenerated. They're, you know, they're re. No, it was re. Yeah, re regenerated recreations. Because what they are is recreating what's missing, but giving it a new, realistic lease of life. It's important mm -hmm. that I don't want to look at a cartoon. I don't want to look at somebody's still photo slideshow i want to look at these characters talking and moving and this is the first time we've been able to do so and in doing so it puts the bbc's animations to shame the problem is i have to keep it very low key only for my members because i don't want the bbc turning on me and if they didn't no. get very nasty i've already made it very clear to them because the other day they actually blocked two of the videos months after they were put up someone physically went gone back and blocked them and i Present them in no uncertain terms. If you do this, if you did me who saved found you 20 odd episodes but saved 150 more from being destroyed and spent my own money to do it to stop the destruction, me who's done so much to earn you money, if you shit all over me, I will shit all over you. I will get all my 6,000 followers to block, boy, boycott and block all BBC videos and Blu rays. That's how determined I am. If they put, if I get a cease and desist letter from the BBC, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to every newspaper and TV chat show and ITV and Channel 5 and everywhere. I will go out of my way to embarrass them because I just want to be left alone. Leave me alone, BBC. Let me make my episodes decently. I won't slag I've stopped slagging off the collections or anything. I'm not going to be persecuted by them. I'm not. And I want to make these episodes... You know, I've got cancer and I had cancer before. I may die. I don't I don't want to die. I hope to. the reason I'm having this huge operation is because I want to live. It's my only chance of living. So the point is, is that 
before I die, I want to make all these episodes and watch them and enjoy them. That's my last, most important wish. And I won't let anyone get in my way, not anyone. If your material, if your output on this project isn't to their personal taste, then that's fine, isn't it? You know, you, but, I don't but, care what they think. I don't yeah. want them to watch. It's not for them. I'm not it's making not for them. Yeah, them. Yeah, I don't fine. give a shit what they think. So the adversity... All I, care about, all I care is that they look like what I saw in the 60s. I want Doctor Who to have a complete library with no episodes missing, and that's my goal. That's what I'm working towards. Anyone who wants to help me, wants to chip in a little bit, is gratefully appreciated. Because, to be honest, having spent 60 grand in, not so, you know, to get the rest done is a bit tight. And it's not an inc inconsiderable sum, is it? You faced a lot of adversity along the way. Uh, vocal they've, they've detractors. They've called me a scammer. Even in a face group, Ian Levine is a scammer and a nut job, which thankfully, after months of trying, we've got it removed now. If how can I scam people when I spend 60 grand making these episodes? Where's the scam? And I've given them to people free. Where, tell me, where's the scam? What I think is far more important is the endorsements that you've received, Ian. I mean, these are just these are just some of the things that people have said. This one from Stephen Williams, and he says, I am always more anxious to see these episodes that Ian is doing than any of the BBC Blu-ray classic collections that, are, that are, they are releasing. I already have all of those classics on DVD that I have seen heaps of times, but Ian's work is now allowing me to see stories I have never had the chance to see and feel like a young kid even though he's 54, uh, waiting to see new episodes being transmitted for the first time. So that's from Stephen Williams, making him but feel I've like also, a child I've again. Also, I've also had endorsement from Warris is saying Caroline Ford and Fraser Hines, which is brilliant. Warris is lovely. Warris is, 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 is torn on the horns of a dilemma. Warris feels, because the BBC destroyed his whole story, Marco Polo, he obviously feels resentment, and even more now, the BBC can't even release his unearthly child. He obviously yeah. feels resentment. And the point is, no matter what we do in Marco Polo, it can't be his exact camera angles, can it, if we're recreating it from pictures? And he's resentful that he can't see his original shooting camera angles, but he thinks what I'm doing is brilliant, and he actually said the singing sands, the effects of the sandstorm are better now we did than he ever did in 1964 but he still feels that bitterness that you know these aren't the proper originals these are recreations of his originals so much of the endorsement me bringing them back and they'll never be exactly the same as what he directed which is hurtful for him i would feel the same but at least everybody loves the marco polo one marco polo has cost over three grand an episode to me that story it's more important, possibly, than any other story we're recreating, even my favourite story, The Dalek Master Plan. Marco Polo is the, f the story after the first three stories where the companions were loggerheads with each other and felt they'd been ripped out of their own time and Doctor had shanghaied them. They only became friends and companions in Marco Polo. It's the most important shaping of Doctor Whoever, and we're getting there with the missing episodes turn up next week of Marco Polo. They won't be much better than what we've done. Because in this case, what we've done is artistically beautiful. The Cave of 500 Eyes with all the little quartz things glittering. It looks very visually artistic and poetic. It's wonderful. That I'm so proud of. We have got this feedback here from Warris so you've been generous enough to share. He said, uh, Ian, I appreciate your devotion to my youthful work and want to award you a special Oscar for the unbelievable results but I should to think at my amateur static shooting of the dialogue. What a, what, what a modest man. Reminds me of my early days. But please continue with your dedicated hard work. You make me proud. And then he, he finishes off saying, it's a marvellous congratulations, Ian, for your devoted work. You are indeed a genius. And I am proud and grateful. What a sweet man. Hugs, Warris. He's a lovely man. Lovely man. And I'm you say you've heard... And so when we had the Omni we were 11 years ago, in 2013, when we all thought Philip Morris had got the Web of Fear, uh, the Enemy of the World, and Marco Polo. And, of course, Marco Polo is not true. And for 11 years, he's teased people that the wind is blowing in the right direction. He told Annika Wills that she was going to see Power of the Daleks. He told Chris, uh, Christopher Barry he was going to see Power of the Daleks. 
before he died. Then Christopher Bay did die. When I said online, what a shame, Pete McTighe turned on me viciously, said I was using Christopher Bay's death to criticise Philip Morris. And I've never spoken to him since. He's been awful to me. Horrible. We were good friends. We used to have lunch. He personally put together, with all my footage, an uh, actual long extended version of Silver Nemesis. Part. But yeah, all three episodes. Yeah, we did an extended version for me. when we had lunch at a little... Uh, Old in a uh, wonderful old English restaurant on Eating Common that burned down since. We had a wonderful lunch together. He was nice as pie to me. He was as friendly to me as you are. And now when I'm at the BFI, he when he walks past me, he's got his nose in the air as if like he's smelling shit. You know, he just treats me like shit. You've continued to endorse the BBC collection on Blu-ray, haven't you? At every opportunity, you've oh, been yes, very, very yes. vocal in your support of because those fabulous box sets. Uh, behind the scenes documentary with Chris Chapman is fantastic. That documentary made about Graham Williams' family. I wet bucket. I went to the premiere at the BFI. I wet buckets. What a wonderful man he is. He, he I was in one of his documentaries about Jane T called Showman. That was brilliant too. Yeah, we had Chris on the podcast. We talked about it extensively. He's he was very generous with his time. And yeah, we still Great talk man. about that production. Okay. There's some great people work for that box, the, the collection. Great people. Chris Chapman's fantastic. And um, I know the, or Peter Crocker, who restores the episodes, is the best restorer of Doctor Who ever. He's a lovely man. Could not say a wrong word of him. But some of the rest of them are just horrors. Your horrors. A constant presence at the BFI screenings and Q&As in London too, aren't you? Most recently, the Happiness Patrol, that was yeah. uh, that was there to publicise season 25, which is out soon, if not out now, by the time this no, gets published. Um, oh, twice. <laughs> the first one, Pete McTagg stood on stage and raved about all the stuff he'd done for the special edition, and they yeah. put it on, and it was the old version. And they had to stop it after five minutes and apologise. They sent the wrong tape. The BBC had sent the wrong tape. So the Sophie Aldred suggested it. She was ta I was talking to her. That. I spent a lot of time with her that day because, you know, she'd worked for me. She did several things for me. I lost in the dark domain. Yeah, she's a lovely Sophie Aldred. Lovely. She's a dear friend. She'd actually worked for me. She made a big fuss of me. She suggested that they redo it with the proper one. And she talked to Justin Johnson. They did redo it. And I got free tickets to go back and see it again. And I, I thought this one was super. Oh, much as I dislike Pete McTighe, oh my God, did he do a great job on this? The sort of dystopian future, sort of Blade Runner style cities, and the the extra scenes. I'd done my own edit many years ago, which is eighteen minutes longer. I haven't yet. When I get my DVD, I'm getting Blu-ray. I mean, I'm going to compare mine to that, see if there's still any scenes I've got that are missing. I gave Ed Struggling my eighteen minutes longer version to pass to Pete McTighe. The pigment tag's intense dislike of me means he probably didn't look at it. So, you know, I don't know if they've used any all of my footage or not, but I had all sorts of stuff. That, that would be a pity because it, it does seem that you and Pete have, had, have a lot more in common than you've I done. Know. So I, I do it hope hurts. that... It hurts. It hurts that he fell out of me. If he gets to see this, pigment tag, you were a friend of mine. You didn't need to shit on me like you did. Very, very talented man. I'm a huge, huge fan of, of Pete's. But when you watch this, when you watch this material, when you go to these events and you see what uh, creative, industrious people, people who are as big as uh, fans as you or I, what they've managed to achieve together, did you still get that kind of feeling of anticipation and the hair standing up on the back that's of your neck why, and things like that's that? That's why I raved about the collections because they've done some wonderful stuff, some wonderful re edit. The uh, Terror of the Autons re edit with the actual. Always, they always wanted to have a creature appear between the two telescopes and the two dishes, and they never could afford to, so it just a little bit of white glow at the time. Thought they'd, some of the stuff they've done has, has lifted it. Day of the Daleks especially, because I always hated those Dalek voices. And John Pertwee put me against it when we were sitting having dinner once. He said, what I most hate is the fact that there's supposed to be a Daleks invasion. You've got three stupid Daleks on their own walking up the lawn towards the house. How are you supposed to take that seriously? Well, they fixed it. They made it much better. And I do like, not all the new versions have been better than the old ones, but this certainly was. So Having the ear of people who are involved in productions like that, and, you know, knowing the things that, that both frustrated and delighted them, it does afford you a certain sort of insight, doesn't it, into, it, it, okay, 
There's some people mock me now because I used to be so well and I'm not now. But I'm doing things a different way. But they mock because I was so well in in the 80s. I was there for every studio recording. I mean, Peter Davison there calls me the Bible. But when I went up to him to give him a big hug there, he called me, it's the Bible. Because that's what they used to call me, you know, the Bible of Doctor Who. He knew everything. And Eric Sayward, of course, on the other side of me. Him and I have always been close friends, very close friends. I've always had a. Eric doesn't like to admit things in public, which is why he still won't admit that I co wrote Attack of the Simon with him. It's all I can do to get, you know, because well, Attack of the Simon was written by me and I wrote, I wrote the basic plot, but he, I didn't write any of the dialogue. He wrote all the dialogue. And basically, he got his ex girlfriend, Paula Woolsey, to use the name Paula Moore and collect the money on the basis she could keep 10% and we get the other 90%. Problem is, she kept all the money and she told her to go out to stuff it kind of thing. Once she signed the paper, she was entitled to keep the money. No one could prove that she hadn't written it when she didn't write a word of it. But of course, all the people that rely on paperwork, all the the big stuffy people yeah. of the world, if you follow reading between the lines, you know, won't, won't accept it because they only rely on the paperwork. It's like the children of January became a joke. It was only written as a filler, as a... That was yeah, the guy with the yeah. three-barrel name, wasn't it, that wrote that? Uh, Michael Feeney Callan. That's it, that's it. It was never going to be used. It was always just, for J&T's sake, something that could be said at the last minute, oh, it's no good, it's fallen through, so it's going to write Gallifrey. And no one believes me to this day. I've been completely pilloried over this. You know, I in, like Eric's def in Eric's defence, it's been a long time ago, and, and there's nothing wrong Eric's with him being a, pri not, being a private Eric man. Eric's memory is not great. It never has been. But mine is. Neither's mine, Eric. I may have had a stroke, but I've got a bloody good memory. I may get the odd thing wrong that people will pick up on, proving me facts. I mean, I said I made a miscall about Doctor in Distress once, though. The self, I mean, I was never been able to live it down. So, yeah, something, you know, the written word isn't always the truth. Do you think that? We can, because we have a lot of people on, on this show and the podcast and the live streams, everything that we do, who work in this field, have worked in this field. There's a, for people who are sort of outside of it, there's this belief that it's all like this well oiled machine and nothing could ever possibly go wrong and that everything is all really well documented and nothing gets done by word of mouth or over a boozy lunch or all that. And so when you come out with things like, oh, it was never written down, there's no paperwork, then, oh, it's in that case, it's ridiculous then. I Whereas know, it's not, in reality of it. JT, when he was at heaven, Gary Downey used to go cruising and JT would sit in the DJ booth with me every night virtually. Cruising. <laughs> Acted a membership that came in every night. I got his drinks for him, so he's drinking pints of vodka and orange. The bartender, as soon as he finished one, the bartender would come up, get him another one without him paying a penny. So he poured it, you know, he like he said to me, you know, I'm not happy that Robert Holmes is doing the five doctors, but he wants to use Sutek as the main villain. Now, this obviously never got written down because Robert Holmes got fed up and walked off because John wanted the Daleks and the Simon and this, that, and the other. And it became a shopping list, and Robert Holmes wouldn't do it. But Sutet was definitely going to be the villain, and that never got written down, and therefore no one believes me. Except if I had a time machine to go back to the moment when JT told it to me, I can prove that that came out of his mouth. In the same way as if I only had a time machine to show me ripping off the tape from the Daleks' film cans and putting them back on the shelf, then people... I can't believe anyone would doubt that after all these years of it being established. How anyone could accuse me of lying about that is ridiculous. Because that Dalek, the seven episodes of the Daleks, Dead Planet Survivors, Escape the Ambush, The Expedition, The Ordeal, The Rescue. You see, I told you I've got a good memory. Anyway, those pl that was about to be destroyed and had already been marked, withdrawn, deaccessioned, and junked. So, you know, I saved it by one day. One day later, it would have gone forever. One of my greatest achievements. Except I didn't save it to watch Benjamin Cook and Marquez fuck it out the way they did. I really didn't want... That's not why I saved it. And Russell Some... C. Davis treating older fans as if they're maggots, as if they have no right to love Doctor Who, as if only his new young friends... You know, he's, I mean... I've been accused by people of being a bigger. I'm gay. I'm disabled. I mean, 
how much more of a minority could I be? Have at least six very close trans friends. I don't think they're trans and Jagay needs to be rushed, forced down your face in Doctor Who just because I'm gay. I don't need to see the Doctor snog a bloke. It's just not what the show's about. All the new super sensitive snowflakes, they call them, they all hate me saying it. And I've been accused of being a self hating gay, which nothing could be further than. Nothing could be further than the no. truth. I've had my autobiography, which was printed only for 50 people, kept secret for only my closest friends. I had the audacious mendacity to read it out in the air and mock my dead parents. Now, to me, that is the lowest of the lowest ever. Yes. So because of that, I got that video removed from YouTube and got a copyright strike against the person that put it up. He's so furious that I got it removed and he got a strike that he dared to come back to me and demand that I remove my complaint when he can shove it. You know, I'm not going to have anyone stand there and criticize my dead parents. Who the fuck do you think you are? What's my parents and my relationship with them got to do with Doctor Who? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's my private book. I chose not to print it. Lots of people offer me money to print it, but I chose only to give it to my dearest friends. It's not. Somebody called me out of a digital copy. They were. They actually oh, I see. Me, let me tell you what happened. They actually told me they'd seen me at the BFI. They said they liked all the blokes. They were too shy to come up to me. They're a big Doctor Who fan. They wanted to come around and meet me. And they conned me into believing they were on the level. So some things they said tripped themselves up. And I realized they claimed to be 30 years old. But he was talking about seeing me in heaven in the 80s. Now, if, if he wasn't in heaven, let's say in 1985, if he was 18 years old then, it would have meant he'd had to be born in... Um, 67, 68? Yeah. So he put it, which would make him seven, seventy seven, eight, seven, nine, seven, nine, seven, seventy, make him fifty odd now, nearly sixty, right? So yeah. he put him nearly thirty. So I realized he'd come me. I'd already stupidly sent him a digital copy of my autobiography, which the minute I sussed what he was trying to do, I said to him, I've caught you out here. You're not who you say you are. He went straight on this archive, internet archive, and printed my put my book up publicly, which Andy Fairclough, my moderator, got taken down. Because it's highly copyright and highly personal, they had no right very, to do very it. Personal. In that time, this this loathsome cockroach in Arizona got a hold of a copy and had the audacity to read it out in the air on on YouTube. And it's not that's, his that's the point. It's my okay. personal private book to that's... mock it, read it in a voice that mocks it. Talk about what I said about when my father met my mother and mock the fact that I called my father a big strapping blonde guy, you know, which he was. You know, we, my mother was a very film star, looks like Ava Garner. If you look at the pictures, it proves it. My grandmother was a very materialistic person. She didn't want anyone to marry my mother who couldn't afford to keep her in the lifestyle she wanted. So because of that, he mocked. He said, how could money be more important than, you know, mocking my grandmother, mocking my parents? I mean, the guy's diseased piece of filth i've got no it's one thing like 30 40 years ago for people to see something that you'd said uh publicly or read oh, something God. from you in starburst that they don't agree with then they may write a letter say i yeah. really disagree with what ian said and and it would go back and forward like that yeah. but now in the here and now it all happens in an instant and people say and do things which are so beyond the pale in the uh, blink of an eye before they yeah. even had time Danny claimed it was fair use. How can stealing my it's outrageous? Yeah, possibly ever constitute fair use was not written for the public to read. It was not. I mean, a mutual a friend of, of ours told me about that, and I couldn't believe my ears. And I, it just so happened that later that evening, I heard from Our you as well. Friend mocked him and took him to task over it. <laughs> brilliantly, so brilliantly. brilliantly it's, yeah. it's what, I don't think we're that outspoken here, but we, you know, we. Well, you but the thing that I notice, broadly speaking, about what you're doing, whether it's with the Motown reunion, whether it's with your school reunion, whether it's uh, or whether it's with the the new episodes oh, with these yeah, reconstructions. Family reunions. I've had four family reunions. Family. The last one in England. Five hundred members from all over the world. The all exactly. and all, but all of this, yeah. it's it's all it's all like banging a drum and involving as many people as possible. And I get the impression that you enjoy it because yeah, it's not exclusive; it's I'm inclusive. I get off my but, ass and I do things. I have always done things all my life. I've written five books about my history, my family, which the chief rabbi endorsed. I've done. I've, I've, 
I, I, if no, nobody else can do what I've done, nobody else. Ian, there's survive. a narrative out there that everything that you've done is purely for yourself and that you live in some sort of bunker surrounded by these missing episodes and all these other projects that you've created just for you and that you're this sort of very insular, very selfish, very exclusive man. And whereas the, the guy that I've got to know and the person that you are on social media is actually really quite generous, as generous spent, as, you, as spent, one can be. We spent £60,000 so far, of which the contributors haven't covered nearly a quarter. We spent sixty thousand pounds. I had to raise the money myself by selling off royalties in advance and stuff like that, just to squeeze whatever penny I could together to doing them, making huge sacrifices so they would exist. And if I was being selfish, why would I have given? Uh, so far, on the contributors group, we've got forty-eight episodes. Of those, I've actually done fifty-five so far. I've got uh, seven more that are almost finished, virtually ready to go. In fact, that makes fifty-five episodes. Now, why would I give 25 of those free to my main Doctor Who group with no catch whatsoever? Those 25 will cost at least 30 grand to make. And that I'll give leads them all free me. without asking for a penny in return just so people can enjoy them. And what do they do? They go and put them on Twitter. That awful Josh Snares in America, when I specifically, in Australia, I mean, not America, sorry, Josh Snares in Australia, when I specifically said, do not share these, he went straight on Twitter with them to boast that he had the links. And that's why I blocked him and banned him. You know, I think the guy was jealous. He made some Dalek Master Plan recons where they're just like, for, like uh, beginning of Monty Path, you know, where figures just move like that. Yeah, that's I've that. seen. That's what I've seen what Josh has done. Yeah, fact, very creative man. The fact that, no, I don't agree. One thing for people not to, not to appreciate your work and to respond, uh, to say so in a constructive and polite way, but to go, to be personal at all really is sort of beyond the pale, but to go this or that personal, it, it's hard to, I understand you, you are considering legal action against that one person, so we probably can't, can't go there. It's, but, obsess it's obsessive. I don't obsessive, want, I don't, yeah. I don't like this person. I don't want him in my life. I don't want to even have to think about him. His actions forced me to confront him, and I don't want to. I was forced to fight him to get his video removed. I don't want him in my life. I've got, I'm more, more bothered about... It's a waste of your time. More bothered about Celestial Toolmaker Part 1 had 20 faults yesterday. I want to get them fixed before I can show it to people. That's what I'm more bothered about. Because you are working pretty much a full eight or nine hour yeah. day on these projects, aren't you? 14? Do you mind eight or nine hours a day? <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.